Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Harrison Wadsworth. I work for uh, Siemens Corporation and here in Washington, D.C. in government affairs. Um, I do not work for Siemens Health Engineers. I should clarify that up front. I work for the other, uh, the other Siemens company, but uh, the larger overall corporation works for Siemens Health Engineers. It's a separate, separately managed uh, company. Um, I cover cybersecurity for the company, uh, especially before, uh, before the federal government. Um, we were preparing for the panel and we were talking about how, as we move into an era of the Internet of Medical Things, devices become more and more connected, the attack surface increasingly grows for malicious actors. There's also increased risk that um, simple configuration problems can, can cause uh, you know, new cyber exposure that you might not have considered before. Um, and I think everybody in this room has an idea of the cyber risk that's out there, right? That's a big problem, but um, it takes uh, industry and government uh, coming together in places like this to be able to find the right solutions. And so that's what we wanted to kind of talk to this morning and uh, talk about how we build a better ecosystem for that kind of information exchange and find out what the best practices are and uh, understanding the overall threat environment. Harrison, do you mind going on? Oh, okay. Is that better? That's better. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to touch on government Much better. integration, um, uh, the overall threat environment, uh, secure software development, best practices, um, dealing with vulnerabilities and transparency and making sure uh, um, that that's handled appropriately and there's incentives to encourage uh, dealing with vulnerabilities the right way. And uh, Stephanie told me nobody in this room is shy about asking questions, so feel free to raise your hand and participate. And uh, I know we got Rob on the phone too, so we will be sure to keep him uh, really constant. So maybe I'll start it off. Um, so we know that the FDA in particular is concerned about cybersecurity now, and that, um, as I just said, we're, we're, there needs to be industry government collaboration to find the right solutions. Um, maybe I'll just open it up to whoever wants to, to chime in. Um, what's working so far and what more needs to be done? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm Suzanne Schwartz from the FDA from Center for Devices and Immunological Health. Um, let me also just ask a question in terms of all of you who are present in the room. If you could just show of hands, how many of you within your organizations have any direct visibility on cybersecurity concerns on the product side? not on the enterprise side. And so some of you, okay, great. I uh, just want to know how to calibrate also some of our uh, concerns and not getting too much into tech jargon and keeping it at a high level. So um, I'm gonna start off with an observation uh, or a reflection. And um, where's Cisco? He's probably all the way in the back. There we go. So Cisco back even, I think it was 2014, I was thinking about it this morning. Uh, you and I had spoken about some of the real parallels between case for quality as it was in the process of being developed in, as an initiative within CRH and the work that we were starting, that we were initiating uh, with respect to medical device cybersecurity. And we saw so much there that uh, was worthy of conversation and bringing together this notion of collaboration of multi-stakeholder engagement of the public sector and the private sector, government and industry absolutely needing to work together here. Uh, we talk a lot in cybersecurity about shared ownership and shared responsibility that um, the FDA alone, any other government agency alone, industry alone, healthcare delivery organizations alone are not able to address this very complex challenge in space, but that it really requires that public community. So the collaboration engagement piece is really important. The other one that I thought, you know, uh, Joe highlighted as well, and Cisco and I have talked about, is this notion of continuous quality improvement, particularly in terms of where we started out at FDA in 2013, 2014, recognizing that this was a challenge space that we internally within the organization did not necessarily possess a wealth or depth of subject matter expertise and an understanding of what was happening. And it was really through the idea that this was going to be a journey for us. This was going to be a learning for us, that we were going to journey together with industry and with security researchers and other experts out there and healthcare delivery organizations with the, again, idea that we're not going to go from zero to 100 in one, uh, you know, with, with the uh, switch of a, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, 
uh, a, a quick you know movement, but rather that this was going to be uh, a systematic, thoughtful approach, an incremental one in terms of really understanding the space and making those kinds of improvements in a continuous manner. And therefore, a lot of even the verbiage that we've used in our guidance uh, with respect to cybersecurity crosses over into the case for quality space around this idea of continuous quality improvement. So I, I think that, um, you know, again, collaboration is working really well. We've been growing that collaborative space uh, to the extent that uh, there are many more engaged stakeholders. And uh, one of our challenges right now is making sure that all the different groups that do raise their hands and say they want to be involved in collaborating, that there's also a sense of cohesion around the, uh, those efforts and that we don't have splintering and folks going off and doing different things that may, may be uh, you know, uh, uh, conflicting with one another or duplicative because resources are rather limited in cybersecurity. And so as much as we can pool together those resources and work in a, as a collective, towards addressing these challenges, and that is going to help us be successful. Yes, I'll, I'll go next. Um, hi, I'm Zach Rothstein with AdvaMed, uh, Advanced Medical Technology Association. Um, so just to, to really piggyback off of what Suzanne said, I mean, from, from the industry's perspective, FDA has been far and away, I think, a, a gold standard in terms of how a regulated industry should think about cybersecurity. Um, obviously, starting back, you know, now almost five years ago, the pre original pre-market guidance, and now today we're at a second version of that pre-market guidance. We have robust post-market guidance, and outside of the actual regulatory work, I think something Suzanne left out is is really just how much of a driver she and FDA have been in bringing the larger community together, right? So we have a set of cybersecurity principles at Avamed. Um, one of them is government should be working with industry when it comes to regulating cybersecurity, and obviously you check that mark. The other one, and, and one of our primary ones, is that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. And we say that because even though we play a major role as medical device manufacturers in securing our products and helping to secure the larger network, we're just one part of that larger network, right? And so there are other threat uh, vectors and, and or attack vectors and threats that we have to uh, be mindful of, but we don't always control uh, their capabilities uh, of, of getting into the system. And FDA has really encouraged and led a big charge in terms of bringing together folks outside of just the medical device community to work together. So that includes hospitals and it includes supply chain vendors, um, and, and especially actually the white hat hacker community. Um, when I started at Avamed about four and a half years ago, we didn't really have much of a relationship at that time with more than maybe one or two uh, prominent white hat hackers. That is, I think, totally changed. We're now in a position where I'm aware of many of our companies bringing them in uh, for different product reviews. FDA, I know, you know, encourages their use as well. So it, it's been a sea change, I think, in, in large part because of the efforts that the agency has done over these last five years or so. Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Reinstaff. I lead cybersecurity solutions for the CIMI Institute. Uh, and I actually participated in the case for quality um, going back maybe four years ago, three years ago, when we first moved into our first three pilots. And uh, in all sincerity, it's actually been one of the areas I've been very proud of uh, is this initiative and having been uh, a part of this initiative because it's quite extraordinary this kind of Copernican shift away from a focus on compliance-driven resilience to more of a uh, elevated and focus on what are the capabilities necessary to drive continuous improvement, uh, which is at the you know, center of what CMI does. Now, for the last two years, uh, I've focused entirely upon cybersecurity um, and focused entirely upon interviewing probably 600 uh, organizations, CISOs, CSOs, CIOs, on how they're approaching cybersecurity and what are some of the effective uh, approaches for building a a cyber secure uh, and a resilient organization. And one of the things that I think is interesting that Case for Quality has demonstrated is that cybersecurity is not a um, compliance-driven effort, right? 
compliance is the exhaust from an effective cybersecurity program. And so then the question becomes, well, what does a, an effective cybersecurity program mean? And I, I think for us, it's a part of the lessons that we've learned, because there's a, there's a lot of body of knowledge. Right? There's a lot of competing frameworks. There's questions about, do you have a single framework? Do you have multiple frameworks? Do you have industry-specific frameworks? But what we found through our research is that starting to put cybersecurity into a business context, right, a very strategic approach, which starts with identifying the risks, right? What are the risks that we're most concerned about? And then harvesting from these different bodies of knowledge, what are those capabilities? What are those practices that help to mitigate those risks? It was part of what we found is the key because there is no single framework to rely upon. Most of these frameworks evolve every three, four, or five years. This industry is changing every three, four, five days. And so being able to keep the ability to harness or harvest across multiple frameworks to address the risk that you're facing is part of what we found uh, is the key. The second thing is, but I think it's actually really applicable here, is the importance of democratizing the knowledge. Um, far too often, most frameworks, most bodies of knowledge operate at a fairly high taxonomy. Right? The level of abstraction requires some interpretation, requires some expertise. And so I, I work with a number of governments around the world. They produce principles, right? You have someone like CS that has critical controls, but I think the concept of how do we identify the things that matter most and then make them very pragmatic in the ability to apply them to organizations is important. And so I think especially for what we're talking about, the ability for us to provide direction especially since what, two thirds of SMEs, small, medium enterprises, at least two thirds. Um, I think it's important that the insights we deliver are very pragmatic and able to be singularly focused on those risks of greatest concern uh, for our sector. Do you want to ask Rob to? Yeah, yeah, Rob, if you can uh, hear us, did, did you want to um, start out with any opening comments? Absolutely. Uh, well, I, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize to the group, uh, unfortunately. Um, airplanes don't like me right now. But, um, but also, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to share uh, the perspective of a, of a technology company when it comes to cybersecurity. And uh, I thought uh, the other panelists um, covered this question very well. I, I would just add that a security defect is a quality defect. And, and that that mindset is what um, what I've used over the last several years in leveraging quality management systems to incorporate different aspects and practices of security um, and, and throughout the product lifecycle, um, from design control to you know, incorporating security requirements uh, for for products to the types of testing that we do in products, the way that we assess uh, security risk in, in products, uh, trying to find the intersections of what exists today uh, from a quality perspective, and then also introducing that security component as well. I would say what's gone very well is um, the FDA pre-market and post-market guidance has been uh, tremendously helpful. Um, and, and boy, that was, I would say, three years ago, really, where you know the the bulk of, of uh, that that effort went in in, in leveraging the FDA uh, uh, the FDA cybersecurity guidance in, in making cybersecurity a priority uh, for for uh, product development teams, product marketing folks as well, and and actually implementing the, the right types of practices, again, throughout the product lifecycle. Fortunately, we have a lot of great um, industry material that has uh, been developed to support the adoption of these security practices. So, you, you know, you don't have to hear them all here, but um, I do recommend uh, for folks in the room to take a look at the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council's um, industry product called the Joint Security Plan, otherwise referred to as the JSP. This is a singular document where uh, it describes all these different practices that you can incorporate into your quality management system. It was jointly developed care providers and uh, and med tech companies as well as um, uh, alongside the FDA and uh, AdMed 
And so um, please do take a look at that. I think what, what remains in, in this space is the cultural change um, that, that is needed. The, the perception of, of how, why is security important and why do we do certain practices? Um, and a, a great example of that is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. The importance of driving transparency and collaboration even when it comes to tough, tough issues like the vulnerabilities that exist in technology, in all technology, because that is a fact of life. All, all technology has vulnerabilities and our customers can't secure what they need. Uh, but also trust is an important component relationship we have with our customers and the patients. Rob, I might have lost you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, that, uh, actually, Rob, your last comment there, well, well, everybody kind of said this, something along the same lines as compliance does not drive innovation in cybersecurity. Compliance drives compliance. I like the, the line that um, the bug mentioned about compliance is the exhaust or the, the outcome of, of, uh, of having an effective program. Um, I think one, one thing we were talking about when we had a call the other day is um, the importance of everybody knowing their role in, in, in advancing cybersecurity. So let me ask uh, a use case type of question. Um, every OEM out there now knows what their requirements are for, for building secure devices and, and putting devices in the market that aren't going to introduce vulnerabilities. But what happens when there's an attack on a hospital network and it affects a device? Where does the OEM's responsibility start? Where does the hospital's responsibility start? And what's the role of government? Let's say if the attacker is a, a nation state, uh, not someone out there, uh, you know, a private, private criminal group. Um, when, when does the, uh, what, what, how do you separate those roles? Or do you? Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could probably get us started on that and maybe lend you the perspective of uh, a company and also, um, you know, Harrison, what you described is very similar to the WannaCry and not Petya ransomware attacks that we saw um, over a year ago. Um, and from a, a manufacturer's perspective, um, these are these are very challenging scenarios because it requires preparedness, not just with the manufacturer, uh, but also with the healthcare provider. In a, in a situation where the healthcare provider may be inclined to open their doors to another third party. Um, and so typically, you know, uh, during these types of events, hospitals will shut off their networks. As soon as they know they have a ransomware infection, um, you know, it, things go dark. And, and in those moments, uh, from, an investigation and forensic analysis uh, perspective. We, yeah, we need we need visibility um, as a manufacturer, um, and, and maybe there's a future where we don't necessarily need visibility. We can provide the, the means for healthcare providers to do forensic analysis and investigation within the environment of infected systems, um, given the situation that we have today. And that you know, the current state of response that we typically see during these types of events, you know, uh, you know, hospitals and networks don't go in dark, right? And and the state of disconnectivity, and having observed different types of responses to these events, you know, I think, uh, manufacturers, I, I've noticed a, a, a more seamless response and and uh, effective response when. Um, when Field service uh, for for medical device manufacturers can restore uh, medical devices in an offline state in a, in a private island. Uh, and while that doesn't restore all the functionality for medical devices that have, for example, EHR integration, um, it allow for the medical device to be ready when the customer has a clean bill of health or when they think they have a clean bill of health. I think the other issue that still exists even in that scenario, when you restore a, a medical device in its own you know, offline and private island and you're waiting for the 
customer to, you know, allow network connectivity again, is that, you know, we still need to get to a point where we can do forensic analysis on medical devices that are infected uh, by things like ransomware. And in those situations, um, in those situations, it, there's a challenge where we have chain of custody, where we may have medical devices that have patient information on them. And so these are opportunities for the industry to go through more tabletop exercises and with healthcare providers present and kind of flesh out these details. Um, and by the way, I, I, I don't think I'll, um, I, I can't imagine what we would do if there was a targeted attack in, in, these, in those types of scenarios. Um, it's highly complex and um, certainly I think something that again requires more strong coordination with healthcare providers. So um, Rob, thank you for that. In fact, um, you provided a good segue in terms of what I was going to elaborate a little bit further on and that is the criticality of preparedness and anything that WannaCry uh, demonstrated. It's really no different than any other fall hazards type of an approach that uh, becomes a really important preposition to understand within an organization and across organizations at the ecosystem level how response to an event occurs. And so um, we saw this at FDA working together with MITRE as a gap area. There's a lot of work out there with regard to preparedness and response with other types of hazards, but not on the cybersecurity front within healthcare and particularly not with regard to medical devices. So, um, so first off, as a resource that uh, folks should be aware of, there is a playbook that uh, was issued that was published back in October 2018 uh, that MITRE uh, released uh, together with FDA that really provides that kind of um, framework for how do you prepare and how do you respond to an attack uh, on, a, uh, on a hospital system that can involve medical devices, to an exploit, what are the considerations that one needs to kind of bake in well in advance into preposition. And it becomes important, I'll underscore Rob's point, to really work this together, not in a vacuum, not isolated as a single organization, because we learn through doing these exercises where there are breakdowns in communication that become really important in terms of achieving a response. Ultimately, if there is any type of attack on a healthcare system that can result in, in terms of consequences, a disruption in continuity of clinical care, of clinical operations. So that presents a patient safety concern, and that is something that FDA is definitely concerned around, uh, concerned about, um, and that has to be taken into account. So uh, I, I think the importance of emphasizing uh, that you, you learn through exercises, tabletop exercises, functional exercises that bring together the provider organizations, industry, and government entities to work that together to understand where, uh, where are the failures we talk about in the preparedness world. You exercise the failure, not to futility, but to failure so that you can then go back and iterate on closing those gaps, those areas of disconnect. Uh, and uh, I, I want to cry provided a good opportunity actually in real time to uh, work through some of those real challenges. And some of the learnings that come out of that um, are things like the software bill of materials as well that we've talked about the FDA, that um, we've talked about really across the ecosystem, that um, giving healthcare organizations the data, the material that they need to understand what is residing on their networks and where vulnerabilities exist enables for better protection in advance, enables for better risk mitigation in advance so that if an attack occurs, then they know what's most vulnerable and where they need to go first and foremost. So um, obviously this is not unique to medical devices, right? We see this a lot with software. You don't get to choose the environment that you operate in. Right? You're given the environment that you're going to operate in. But there's a 
pretty good body of knowledge around how to build trustworthy systems, uh, how to design testing. And I think the scoping exercise, and I'll, I'll speak to broadly scoping for a second, is actually mission critical. Understanding the environment that I'm going to be testing my software and the kind of environment my equipment, my devices are going to be used, but also ensuring that as I build out that body of knowledge around how I define resilience, how do I ensure my supply chain, right, that's also feeding into that, uh, is operating under the same set of conditions. If I think about areas of vulnerability, uh, and we're currently working with the uh, Department of Defense in this area, um, this is a significant area of risk, right? How do I ensure that the risks that I've identified, how do I ensure the environments that I believe that I'll be subject to, the kinds of threats that I believe are part of uh, my threat matrix, how do I ensure that my suppliers reflect that same type of risk posture uh, and are thinking about those things as they're building those components that are going into my equipment, I think is also mission, mission critical. Sure, and uh, maybe I'll ask a related question on that since we're talking about software now. Um, maybe, Suzanne, you mentioned the, the, the software building materials project that's going on at uh, NPIA. Um, so what, what are some of the best practices to make sure when you're, when you're building software that's going to be used for let's say, running a medical device or building a medical device, uh, manufacturing a medical device, make sure you're pulling from a secure library, make sure, make sure you're not inadvertently introduce, introducing vulnerabilities. Um, what, maybe, maybe for, for Rob or whoever wants to, to answer that question, what, what, what are some of the best practices? Sure, I, I'm more than glad uh, to take a first uh, stab at that. Um, and, and I think if I heard correctly, Harrison, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, you came in and out of the, the mic there, but um, it, it's how, how do we prevent from introducing more vulnerabilities and risk through uh, third party software and- Yeah, that's right. If you're, if you're pulling from an open source library, how do you make sure you're pulling uh, secure code? Gotcha, okay. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to open source software, it, here's, um, it, it's not necessarily the software itself that's more vulnerable. Uh, it, you know, the, the reality is that humans are fallible, humans write software, and so software is fallible, software has vulnerabilities. Um, until we can uh, solve and uh, resolve all of the, you know, cognitive issues in, in the human mind, we'll, we'll always have software vulnerabilities. When it comes to open source software, the way that we position this to product teams, to software development teams, is as, as you adopt open source software, take a look at the community that supports that open source software, um, identify whether or not they do a good job of remediating, disclosing vulnerabilities routinely and remediating them in a timely fashion. Um, in fact, um, so, you know, there's some really great uh, sources of information that help uh, software developers identify this type of information. We, uh, you know, I, we pay for a uh, private uh, vulnerability uh, feed that shows different types of metrics across software libraries. Um, it, it, it's, it's called, uh, you, you have the National Vulnerability Database today that is free. And it's a healthy habit to see, you know, vulnerabilities disclosed in, in open source software. It's even healthier to see that they're actually patched and mediated in a timely fashion. But otherwise, when, when you adopt open source software, consider it yourselves as the owner of that software. And so if there were to be issues at a later date, you know, the, the software development team needs to consider how they themselves can remediate those software vulnerabilities. Um, and, and that's a tall task, but that's the type of you know, responsibility that it takes when you're adopting open source software. I would just say the other thing in general, when, when developing software, ensuring that we don't introduce more, more risk over time. Well, every time we introduce software to melt the technology, we always introduce more risk. And so the, 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 the goal though, is how do we effectively manage that risk throughout the life cycle of the software? And, and so, you know, there are things that we can do upfront like static code analysis. These are automated tools that check software source code for vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities. And, and, and doing that static code analysis while we're developing uh, pro, uh, software 
Yeah. And then the other thing is vulnerability scanning. Vulnerability scanning is an automated tool for checking for known vulnerabilities in third party components like the Microsoft operating system. Also, uh, it checks for misconfiguration and missing patches. And so again, doing that type of automated uh, scanning allows for a product to effectively manage uh, security risk prior to release and even in post-market with your sustaining engineering teams. Um, and, and I think a bill of materials is also a great uh, piece of information to share with, with your customers so that they can also have a proper understanding and visibility to the types of security risks that, that occur over time and relate those back to the products that they bought from a medical device manufacturer. It's kind of like the nutritional label on, on your food. Maybe just um, two things um, that come to mind for me. The first is, is just on the issue of open source software, the Linux Foundation is actually currently undergoing a series of exercises to identify um, highly used open source software. And then based on the results of that survey, they'll actually start funding through the foundation um, security and, and other practices for those software. So that's, I think that's interesting that we have a, another organization that's not just dedicated in, to the healthcare space, helping um, industries like ours secure or better manage uh, the use of our open source software. The other part that this opens up though for me is more on the post-market side. Um, and and it's, it's two things. One is in the new pre-market guidance that FDA issued, part of what FDA wants to see now at the front end um, of the review is how will you issue a cybersecurity update to the device once it's in the field. Um, I think it's fair to say for most of us, it's not a matter of if, but when, you'll need to update your software um, for, for any medical device that's in the field, especially if it's going to exist in the field for a considerable period of time. So that's an interesting change um, that, that, I, that we supported you know, in our comments, and I think the industry understands why FDA would want to make sure that you have those kind of protocols in place at the pre-market stage. The, the, the other piece of this that FDA also has, has implemented that's really helpful for, for companies, um, and it also is helpful for hospitals because they didn't always understand this, but that is, as a manufacturer, um, you can update software in the post-market environment for purposes of cybersecurity without going back to the agency for a new 510K or PMA. And that's incredibly important. It's something that um, you know we actually would like other uh, regional re medical device regulators across the world to adopt as well, because that's very important for us to be able to not only issue these patches, but also understand the regulatory implications they have uh, from an approval perspective. So um, what we thought here, and, and that is, I think there's a lot of good areas to find best practices, right? There are certainly CMI software dev, there's certainly BSIM. But I think one of the things that's, and it's perhaps the raison d'etre for CMI is it's about demonstrating capability, right? It's one thing, I think, to have a checklist that I could demonstrate and I can go through and say, I'm doing these things, but it's different to be capable, right? To demonstrate persistence. I mean, it's part of, I think, what, it, what helps drive the success of this program is it isn't simply going through and saying, yeah, that person is supposed to do that. Yeah, that person's been trained enough, but actually demonstrating that it's habitual and that people are trained and that people have updated policies and procedures and that the things that they're supposed to be doing are demonstrated and they are doing, I think is the key. I think most people know what are the right things to be done. The problem is, is they are institutionalized, right? They're not persistent within organizations. So I think being able to demonstrate persistence of these things and knowing that not only do we know what it takes to build trustworthy systems, right? And I think a lot of us who work in software knows what that means, but are those, are we actually capable of doing that? Are people effectively trained? Is there truly governance over these types of capabilities where we can demonstrate at any time that those things are being done and people are trained on that and that we measure those uh, to demonstrate that they're being done effectively and correctly, uh, I think is actually part of the, uh, part of the key. Yeah, and I, I think that bringing all of these points together, all these threads together, 
the approach that we took with the pre-market guidance update uh, that was issued uh, back last fall was one of really building on what emerges as three cornerstones, and that is the trustworthiness, transparency, and resilience. Everything that we're talking about here is, you know, how do we, from the start, a priority to begin to build and develop medical devices that uh, uh, encompass really these three aspects. And it's not just the product, but it's organizationally and it's the culture within the ecosystem that embodies these principles of trustworthiness, transparency, and resilience. Uh, so I also want to point to a document, a draft that came out from NIST last week, I think it was, um, on their secu uh, security software development lifecycle, secure software development lifecycle framework, because Again, the thinking and the approach there is one that FDA believes, you know, really we all have to be moving towards in this concept of it's not just about, you know, uh, getting a product on the market, but having those capabilities uh, demonstrated and built into the DNA of, of the organization so that that product has resilience throughout its lifespan. You know, you know, what's really interesting is working for Siemens, we're such a diverse company that I hear talks like this from all different sectors of the economy. Um, and the same concerns pop up in every sector, right, about, you know, maintaining the uptime and, and during, during an event, uh, maintaining patchability. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when the uh, Ukraine uh, power grid attack happened a few years ago, um, power plants all over the world have you know, got concerned. How do, how do we maintain our operations with this going on? And... Um, we had a customer actually went around their production floor with a hot glue gun and sealed all the network ports. <laughs> now I'm safe, now I'm air gapped. And said, well, well, how does our field service technician come in and check the analytics on the turbines? And said, oh, well, we left the, the industrial control system still, still available, so you can come in and plug in your laptop. <laughs> right? So a lot, of, a lot of this is just a base level education thing, right? But, but it's like, there's this idea of like, oh, well, if I'm closed off, I'm secure now. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, it can actually make it worse. <laughs> um, so um, that kind of getting on the to the, the, the vulnerability exposure topic. Um, another actually, when I was maybe two weeks on the job at Siemens a few years ago, um, I was asking about how we how we communicate to customers when we discover the, the vulnerability. And um, not getting into the details, basically, you know, once we have a patch ready, we, we push it out to the customers. We're very transparent about it. And what often happens is, you know, without, I'll give you an example without naming the company. One of our one of our big companies, you guys all heard of a big customer of ours. Called, you know, while I was sitting in the office of our product security officer, called and said, how can I keep getting product security bulletins from Siemens about all your security problems when this other vendor we work with has no problems? <laughs> and he said, well, actually, they do. They're just not telling you. Right? But he's, this is a person who makes the first decisions of the company who will stop to switch vendors because we're disclosing our, our vulnerabilities as we discover them. So there's kind of a perverse incentive in some parts of the market that, that encourages a lack of disclosure. So, so the medical device space, how, how do you get at that? Well, let, let me actually just follow up on that yeah. for a second, and I'm going to channel Rob. Um, so, Rob, <laughs> Rob, this is for you. But something we've witnessed um, on our end is when we have companies like BB who do use um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure and they do release patches and updates, it's the press that a lot of times picks up these stories and writes really negative articles mm -hmm. about the fact that certain medical devices have uh, a cybersecurity vulnerability. So after this came out, I think it was this week or last week, you know, the issue wasn't, hey, look how great this is that um, a researcher came to BD, BD worked with them and they fixed uh, the issue. The story was, oh, BD has a cybersecurity problem, right? And that that's not helping. Um, and, and that's a, I, I mean, it's, it's an issue that I think will continue to, to, to exist, but it is something that um, certainly has, I think, stymied some of the adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosure and, and the use of it that we'd love to see. Yeah. That was a good job. <laughs> Rob, if you want to add anything right now, I know that you're very passionate about this, as are we at FDA, uh, because there's uh, there's a lot to talk about here. And um, 
you know, we certainly want to see much broader adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosure across the entire ecosystem. So much so that um, we've uh, been very open in terms of socializing that this is a particular area where we uh, may be looking to require coordinated vulnerability disclosure through legislation in order to level the playing field. Because why should the companies who are demonstrating the kind of behavior that is a role model for all the ecosystem take a hit because of the transparency and the maturity that they are demonstrating while all the others who do have vulnerabilities but are not disclosing them are, are, are essentially protected uh, from the press, uh, from attacks. So we're in, you know, we're in a very good company, I would say, in terms of others who, uh, other entities, other parts of government that have been very clear in stating the importance of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And I'll name a few examples. So let's start with the administration's the president's cyber strategy that came out in September 2018, a plan that now is being put into uh, its implementation phase, calls out across all industry sectors the importance of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. House Energy and Commerce Oversight Subcommittee put out a white paper, I think it was in December of 2018, that calls out the importance of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. FDA's post-market guidance calls out strong recommendations and encouragement of coordinated disclosure policies and processes to be adopted um, through industry, and we've recognized the international standards um, that are specific to those. Um, NTIA, Department of Commerce, it's one of its very first efforts in terms of multi-stakeholder engagement was on coordinating vulnerability disclosure and FDA, as well as I would say, you know, so many medical device manufacturers and AdvaMed were strong um, advocates of, uh, uh, of involvement in that initial work going back a few years ago. Most recently, October 2018, the work that we partnered with NDIC and its initial project on medical device cybersecurity was on developing a landscape analysis and a white paper working together with uh, Depa Boys and Clinton, a, a law firm, to make that business case, so the compelling our argument as to why it's important to be involved in coordinated disclosure. And in fact, um, it, it's really across the financial sector, every other industry sector as well. Uh, and you can look at SEC guidance, um, Security Exchange Commission's guidance in this particular area that has been very clear about the importance of disclosures and doing those in a coordinated manner. And most recently, I think as of yesterday, uh, I don't remember the exact title of the bill, the legislation, but there has been a bill that was <clears throat> Uh, put forward by Senator Warners and, and Gardner that uh, has to do with IoT purchased by, uh, procured by federal government um, that crosses all areas of sector, which in fact, in fact impacts on medical devices that's purchased by the federal government as well, whether it's DOD, whether it's NIH, whether it's you know, any, uh, um, any particular procurement of devices that there needs to be coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So um, I'll get off my uh, 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 the, the, the box here uh, in terms of uh, you know speaking on this particular area, but we feel very strongly about it. And I'll just you know again underscore why so much so in this space because the stakes are really high in safety critical industry. Particularly think about those patients with implanted devices or devices at home that they rely on for their. Uh, you know, for critical life functions and what it's like to find out information that has not been disclosed in a coordinated manner um, and, um, and therefore creates a lot of fear, a lot of concern, a lot of anxiety, a lot of hysteria, which we want to be able to avoid. I think there's a real risk of if the fear kind of takes over that people are, will become afraid to connect their devices and get the continuous optimization, optimization that comes from that and overall lack of trust in the connected technology. 
technology and that's innovation. So that's, that's kind of the rest of the software. Um, I think we have like 10, 15 minutes left. I don't know if anybody in the room has, has questions or wants to bring anything up. Come on, don't prove me wrong. I said you guys weren't going <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, Harrison, you mentioned earlier this, um, you know, this concept of nation-state attacks and the uh, power grid situation. Um, so I'm wondering, with the recent cyber attacks on our elections, um, what, what your thoughts are on that and how you think that's impacting the industry, cybersecurity industry? That's a really good question. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Zach. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I think it gets to that trust issue. Is is that, that's something that the average American thinks about? Is does my vote count, right? And if, if my election can be hacked, what else can be hacked? And you, we should be connecting to each other. We shouldn't be going for analytics from you know sharing information from one sector to another and, and all the optimization comes with it. It seems doesn't produce uh, election infrastructure. So. I've not looked into it all that deeply, but I do read Politico Morning Cybersecurity, so I actually read about it every day. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get back on my uh, soapbox here a little bit. <laughs> um, so uh, we talked several years ago when FDA was really uh, uh, trying to drive the need to pay attention to cybersecurity that the healthcare space is a very soft target. We know this from a national security perspective. Um, we know that um, there are a lot of interested parties that are looking to gain entry into the healthcare ecosystem at large. And, um, and so therefore it becomes a very critical for us to think about cybersecurity, our systems and the devices that reside on our systems uh, because of the potential for nation state, non-nation state, and other kinds of even inadvertent or uh, uh, opportunistic types of impacts on the medical device um, uh, itself, again, or on the systems that can impact on patients. And so we at FDA are concerned about this. We've said a few years ago to healthcare organizations as well, and to the medical device industry that we need to be thinking about this as a hostile environment from going forward. And that's a different mindset that requires quite a bit of a culture and mindset shift from thinking about hospitals, healthcare facilities, where you're used to thinking about that's a place where patients go to, where people go to receive care. And we think about that from the standpoint of, you know, the beneficence, but we have to take on a much more defensive posture and think about what the potential is for different attacks. And um, the WannaCry is a very good illustration of that. We're just purely lucky in the United States. We're purely fortunate that it did not impact our healthcare systems to the same degree that it impacted the NHS in the UK, where there was a very broad effect across multiple um, healthcare organizations facilities. So uh, um, those of us who work within this space in government also have uh, access to information that is secure information or classified information that uh, you know gives us a picture of what's happening out there. But many CISOs of healthcare organizations will tell you today that they are fighting off right and left uh, attacks or attempted attacks. And I think CISOs of medical device manufacturers will say the same in terms of even trying to get at intellectual property. Rob, I don't know if you want to comment here because I think this is something that you and I had a sidebar about just recently in, in your new role. Sure. Uh, I, I would um, just add to that, Suzanne, um, to the audience there. There is a very clear and imminent threat that exists today to, to healthcare when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, every single day, healthcare institutions across the world are, are being attacked. Um, and it would be a shame to have to wait for a catastrophic event in order to truly uh, take action. It's, uh, and, and our goal in 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 uh, in this situation is not necessarily to 
just avoid a catastrophic event. It, it's really to be prepared to respond. It is that um, it is what some may call the, the cybersecurity 912 plan. Um, and and so yeah, I, I do think it's there's there's not enough resources also in cybersecurity uh, in order to truly uh, prepare and mitigate these types of events, and and that is why we are our, our our reach and and really the prioritization of security needs to go beyond just the folks that have security in their title um and and so taking a cross-functional approach to prepare for these types of uh cyber security events the the risk is is certainly yet uh, there's intellectual property risk for manufacturers but uh boy there is also um uh, tons of uh, clinical risk um, it, there's uh, the risk of a global health crisis if a uh, manufacturer of medical technology, you know, if 90% if, uh, of the world's syringes, uh, you know, were not available tomorrow, we would have a global health crisis. Um, if, if you shut down, you know, two or three manufacturing plants uh, for those syringes, uh, you could have a global health crisis. And, and so... Um, you know, it, it, today we're talking about cybersecurity for the medical device, but there is a very complex ecosystem uh, uh, that requires cybersecurity as well. And, and that is why I, I oftentimes say we can't just limit the scope of cybersecurity to just network connected medical devices. No, it's any technology that, that exists in these environments whether it's network connected or not, um, that, that, can, that can present a, a legitimate risk to, to our healthcare industry. Let me uh, offer just two thoughts. Uh, one thought is, I think it's about um, measuring resilience, right? Lockheed Martin did a lot of work on threat kill chain. Uh, with the partnership with Lockheed Martin, we, we kind of evolved to a threat kill cycle, but actually understanding how resilient you are, right? Can't just be at work. Right. I think the second thing is, is that it, it recognizing, and I think this is particularly involved with these large um, state actors, bad state actors, um, is recognizing that this is a very dynamic process. And so best in class organizations uh, have the ability to translate threats into specific operational impacts. Right? What do I need to do differently? How am I taking this threat? How am I modeling this threat? How am I training people against addressing this threat? Uh, what are the specific capabilities that I need in place because of this threat? I think best in class are those that can translate those threats, not wait for a, a framework update, not wait for an audit, um, but immediately understand the operational considerations, operational impact of those threats and adjust accordingly are those organizations that are likely to survive those kind of uh, risks. Can I, okay, and I'll just add, add to that, that um, uh, this is why also in the pre-market guidance update that we just issued, we you know, we talk about really thinking like the adversary. You know that um, as new like new devices are being designed, the importance of threat modeling, the importance of uh, really you know putting on that different hat as to how this device could serve as a you know, as a vector potentially in terms of uh, disseminating uh, and, and creating more damage, more consequence, as well as how could this device in and of itself be impacted and what would be the consequences of doing so as far as its, its intended function and if its performance was affected in a negative way. So you'll be hearing a lot more about what do we mean by threat modeling? What do we mean by, you know, again, um, thinking like the adversary uh, as, as we go forward? Because that is where we need to be moving. You know, people's lives are on the line. Um, say aviation. Um, if, if there's, you know, a cybersecurity issue, um, how how can the industry work? Together? Maybe I'll take the first crack at that one. Um, so we do. Um, there are different forums that that we work through uh, to bring together different stakeholders and talk about these issues. In fact, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee held a series of roundtables uh, where they brought together cybersecurity experts from different 
um, industries. And those conversations revolve around things like coordinated vulnerability disclosure, the use of uh, ISACs and ISAVs, um, and I think there was at least one or two other topics. Um, informally, um, I know that you know different different parts of the different sectors uh, work together on these questions. And then also, um, we as an industry have what's called the Sector Coordinating Council. Um, and this group uh, does bring together the entire healthcare community to work on joint cybersecurity issues. And then that group um, also has capabilities through some of its working efforts um, to link up with, with other critical infrastructure industries and share best practices. So there is a work stream actually in the sector coordinating council specifically for that issue. And I can just, I swear that wasn't a planned question. We've not met before, but we have a uh, we have a forum that Siemens started about two two years ago called the the Charter of Trust for a Secure Digital World. Um, we've got seventeen companies signed on to it now. It's ten principles for securing the digital economy, and they're things that we've talked about today, like controlling your supply chain, um, raising the bar in education within your organization, anchoring cybersecurity in the C suite so people with budget and purchasing authority can make make decisions with security in mind. And, um, and it's not just Siemens, it's Airbus is on, Intel, Cisco, MXP, so, so companies that can bring lessons from their, from their sectors and, and, uh, and we all will jointly agree to raise the bar. Um, and we're operationalizing it um, as of February, every Siemens standard contract uh, for supplier has a provision that says you must guarantee that you've got a certified secure supply chain um, or else you can't supply Siemens anymore. Um, so that was a big deal. That wasn't easy, obviously, to, to get that over the line, and, but we got all 17 partners to agree to it. So um, there's, there's a, uh, and a, a big part of it is committing company resources to work cooperatively with government um, to, to make sure the whole ecosystem can grow. So good question. So just to sort of follow up to that, um, uh, obviously there's a lot of forums that people can participate in, and larger companies obviously have the resources and the ability to do that. But working under the notion that you're only as strong as your weakest link when you're looking at cybersecurity, how do smaller companies, you know, maybe you just focus it on the med device industry, how do small companies become as proficient as this as the larger companies that are afforded those extra resources or ability to do the things? Sure, maybe I'll just repeat it. So it's a rock in here. The question is, um, how does a small company uh, address cybersecurity? By the way, I work for BD, so I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Rob, this is your oh. apology. Uh, how does a small company address cybersecurity the, the way a, a larger company is able to? Sure thing. Hello, fellow BD. -er. <laughs> so for it's interesting, actually. You know, at, at BD, actually, we we work. Uh, very frequently with small to mid-size uh, manufacturers, med tech companies, um, and you know, it, it, there are so many different practices in security that that don't cost a lot of money. It it actually it, it just requires early engagement and an early adoption, I should say. Um, and so, if you look at the joint security plan. Um, again, this industry work product that was developed through the healthcare sector coordinating council, it outlines um, design requirements for security, um, the types of uh, testing uh, that can be done uh, for security, the types of documentation you can generate with templates, uh, uh, tons of ex examples of these types of deliverables, and those types of things actually don't cost a lot of money. What's what's very expensive is actually after the technology has been developed to go back and actually fix those issues. Um, actually, I think the the very challenging things in in these cybersecurity practices are, for example, what we talked about earlier: uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosures for a small to mid sized manufacturer. Doing a coordinated disclosure and the type of misinformation that is produced, uh, you know, can be reputationally uh, detrimental to a small to mid-sized company. And so, um, yeah, I say that being, you know, oftentimes saying at, at these conferences that vulnerability disclosures is the right thing to do. We do it because it's 
because it's empowering our customers uh, and, and because you can't secure what you don't know. But at the same token, like I realized, yeah, that's something that a small to mid-sized manufacturer uh, would be tough pressed to do uh, today. But um, it may surprise you from a technical perspective. Um, you know, if there's early adoption in incorporating security uh, design requirements, I actually don't think those are very costly uh, things to do. It, it's just a matter of addressing them much more earlier in the, in the product development life cycle. Uh, so a couple of the first uh, comment and then a question. So the comment is that this is a case for quality group and a lot of the same things came up in the discussion with this group that we talked about from the quality perspective. It's how can we get the C-suite to embrace the priorities of cybersecurity. We talked about the same thing in terms of quality. And also, uh, I think one of the things Rob brought up is how do we get enough people being educated in cybersecurity so that we have a pool of candidates for the jobs that we need to fill in the industry? And I think the same issue is true uh, in our quality schema. So I think that there are parallels between these two different uh, pieces of the sector. But um, I wanted to ask Suzanne a question that clearly coordinated vulnerability disclosure is critical for this industry and we need to be focused on it. But uh, and I think there's general acceptance of that. So what other things should we be assuming that we're all adopting that? What else should we be thinking about? What else should we be looking at? Pamela, I'm not sure I totally understand. Related to disclosure or related or different Cyber areas? Cybersecurity more broadly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think that um, as we look to take on important areas that are going to really drive uh, uh, a stronger posture with regard to medical device cybersecurity and the ecosystem at large, one area that I would highlight again is um, understanding what it is to put on the hat of the adversary uh, with respect to design of new devices and also in how we think about uh, that role um, in the entire total product life cycle. Um, and that means really understanding what it is, what does it take to do threat modeling in a systematic way? What are the methods that are necessary and can we achieve a level of kind of consistency around an approach that has rigor to it and that uh, moves the industry to a place that, uh, again, enables more securable devices and systems and also enables better perhaps detection around uh, vulnerabilities as they are emerging and understanding of what that impact analysis would look like. And this is an area that um, I think is an opportunity for, uh, uh, for learning and for engaging um, within the medical device space. Um, it's one that is being addressed at security conferences uh, writ large uh, across different industries. But you know, we have um, a gap area here and with respect to uh, what even FDA has learned over the past few years as a result of its work with manufacturers and uh, security experts on vulnerabilities and vulnerability assessment and vulnerability management and, and how that relates back to the threat aspect, um, there's, uh, there's a real opportunity there to, uh, uh, to create a, uh, you know, create trainings, create opportunity for developing the science there specifically for the clinical realm or the medical device industry. All right, well, this has been a terrific discussion. I want to thank our panel.